2011 was a record year for aerospace and defence mergers and acquisitions deals with over 43 billion US dollars recorded uh, for the year. Uh, along with that though, uh, the soaring civil aerospace orders is presenting a problem to industry to fulfil uh, parts orders for these aircraft. Neil, can you talk to me a little about the um, the M and A side? Why was 2011 such a record year for aerospace and defence M and A? Well, I think you know, to, to cover your point about how good the order book is, you know, this is an industry that, uh, you know, from an engineering terms, has ridden the recession with out of blip. You know, it's had increasing levels of orders, new products coming to market, uh, you know, supplying uh, you know the existing. Uh, you know, air infrastructure in Europe and the US, but some huge new customers in, in Asia and the Middle East. So that's really what's behind the industry saying it's time to consolidate, there's value to be created from going out there and, and uh, you know, acquiring some of our competitors. And of that large pie, the 43 billion, uh, what, what sort of percentage or size would the defence sector accommodate? Um, I think typically uh, purely defence is, is, tends to be about a third, but then there's, there's clearly a mix of civil aerospace and defence in many, many companies. Um, and of that uh, pure defence part, uh, the majority of the growth uh, in recent years has come through electronics and, and cyber security and less from the what you might call traditional defence uh, equipment and, and technologies. That's a strong sector though, for, particularly in the UK, isn't it, it? It's extremely strong in the UK. The UK is very much a leader in not only the defence uh, electronics side, but is increasingly developing and spinning off some interesting you know, cyber and security related businesses that are attractive to uh, the existing players in the industry and also to some financial investors. Perhaps that, that sort of diversification out of core defence. Uh, very much so. Yeah, I mean, it's flat in defence, core defence. Uh, and Darren, um, part of your analysis on the Mission Control Report was to look at um, supply chain risk. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe that you, um, you found that uh, examining the uh, readiness, the readiness of some of these suppliers to fulfil the, the order books that they've been given um, ha has presented some problems. Up to 21%, I believe, uh, of the companies that you assessed weren't financially ready. Um, can you talk a little bit about the analysis? Yeah, I mean, I think you've got two uh, factors at play there, really. One is, uh, from the customer side, we've already sort of you know, mentioned the, the record order books. We've probably got an unprecedented number of large-scale new platforms reaching production readiness all at the same time over the next 12 to 18 months. That puts a huge burden on the industry that's probably just never existed before. Combined with a move that's happened in the industry over the last sort of 10 years, where a lot of the upfront cost has been passed into the supply chain, so non-recurring costs, investment in tools, jigs, it's been something that the supply chain has been asked to take on, therefore needs to fund. Um, and so you've got unprecedented number of programs, large investment required. On the other side of it, however, due to the recent financial crisis, the availability of finance has been something that people have found increasingly difficult uh, to actually get hold of. So demand increasing, supply being constrained, that's why I think a lot of people are finding it difficult to balance those two uh, equations. And, and also on, um, in terms of the, the thoroughness with which companies are assessing their supply chain risk management, you found that in the aerospace sector particularly, companies are either overdoing it with uh, very intense uh, assessments or they're, they're, they have a very light touch and you've proposed a sort of alternative middle ground route. I think the key thing here is that clearly this, this can be a big risk to a large OEM when you've got large value aircraft down a production line you need to keep the line running and therefore it's imperative that you keep the parts arriving on a sort of you know, run rate basis that's required for you to deliver your output. I think the danger is, is though that once this is identified as a risk all of the supply chain gets tarred with the same brush and the approach to all is a exactly the same, which can be very overburdening. It can involve a lot of people being deployed into the suppliers. It can be involved in a lot of processes and procedures being followed through and almost becomes an industry in itself while the focus then fundamentally shifts away from the, the, the task it was designed to achieve, which is to deliver the parts. On the other hand, you have had people in the past where they've just ignored it and hoped that you know, it, will, it will go away. It will be uh, something that will right itself and the industry will respond in some way. So I suppose where, where we uh, are coming from is very much one that says choose your approach depending upon the risk profile of your suppliers. People who are high risk perhaps need the more intensive approach. People who are at risk but at a low risk perhaps don't need the same level of intensity. That's interesting. Um, and looking at the aerospace and defence industry in the UK specifically, but also perhaps you know, beyond into Europe, um, where have you identified as being the key areas for innovation, design and R&D in the ne next 12-month cycle? 
I think sort of, I suppose the one thing about the aerospace industry is it, it's a long-term long in industry, so, so you have to look kind of forward. Certainly, you know, one of the big trends um, that you've seen is a move not only in the defence sector but also in the commercial sector from metallic parts to composite parts. Um, and so I think you know, composite technology is something that the UK has invested in. Um, it has got very strong competency in that field, but there's more work and that's going to, the demand for that is going to increase still further. You've also seen the move from hydraulics and pneumatics toward electronics. We haven't quite reached all electric aircraft yet, but potentially we may be doing that. Um, and therefore, again, there's a shift in terms of um, some of the traditional industries into some of the electronics fields that Neil mentioned earlier. And just perhaps if we can finish off, Neil, if you're looking ahead to 2012 and the, the business environment for aerospace mm. and defence and more uh, the M&A activity, um, I understand that we may see more sort of cross-border deals, more, more deals coming out of uh, countries such as China. Uh, than, than traditionally. Cross-border M&A um, has always been something that's been a slight lag, so I think we'll see some catching up of that over the next few years. It's just easier to do deals in country or, or in, in region. Um, there's clearly an interest from the likes of Brazil, from India, from China to develop their own sort of indigenous industries. Now, developing that from scratch is very difficult. Acquiring uh, you know, existing businesses in Europe or the US is, is uh, very much seen as the way to go. Uh, there's obviously some technology and, and intellectual property risks in doing that, and so that there might be some, uh, some impediments for perhaps the likes of China. But if you start looking at India and Brazil, I think they're going to be much more in, uh, acquisitive uh, in the marketplace going forward. To wrap up, really, the story is um, for 2012 and beyond, uh, flat defence, more diversification. Um, advisors like you guys will be helping companies to try to fulfil orders in the rampant uh, aerospace uh, civil aerospace market uh, and also to watch the space for, um, for further R&D in composite materials, an area where the UK is very strong. Well, Neil, Darren, thank you very much.